Take your Bible and turn to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'm uh, beginning a series uh, that we're going to go over the, uh, for four weeks today and the three weeks that will follow, and we're going to talk about choosing victory. Christians, please understand that um, living in victory is just as possible as the sun coming up in the morning. Let, let's take a check. Did the sun come up this morning? Do you think the sun's going to come up tomorrow morning? Living in Christian victory is by the same power of the same hand that keeps that sun turning. And just as God has the power to do that, God has the power to touch your life in a powerful, amazing, glorious way. I know that in the, in the Christian church, that when, when people talk about victory, a lot of people have abused that and they have really what they have said is, I want the victory that I want. And God, I expect you to bring the victory that I want. But what we really need is the victory that God wants us to have. And that's a whole lot more and a whole lot better than anything that we could ever dream up. So let me just be very plain. Your walk talks. And your talk talks. But your walk talks louder then your talk talks. And we need to understand that, that we, there are some great examples that God has given us to learn how we can walk out the victory every day. And the children of Israel is who we're going to be looking at over these four weeks. They are a, a wonderful picture of bringing people out of slavery into the promised land. Out of bondage. Being tired and weary, and worn down by sin, broken, unhappy, and with no hope that anything would ever change. 400 years of oppression. But God saw, God heard, God brought a Redeemer. God brought redemption to that place. God delivered them with a powerful hand so that they and all the known world would know that there is a God in heaven and He loves. The Old Testament shows us principles of the precepts and principles that we follow today. Paul said that we use the Old Testament as an example. Jesus would, would paint pictures with His words. And He would talk about all the things that God had done in His people so that we could learn from their examples. In Deuteronomy 5, in verse 1, there is a, a verse there, we studied it uh, last year, we called it uh, the whisper of God, it's called the Shema, it says, and Moses called all Israel and said to them, hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak to you in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. I say you to you today that God wants to speak to us. God wants to speak. His precepts, His principles, His commandments, that we may learn them and we may follow them, walk in them. In the 32nd verse of that same chapter, it says, Therefore you shall be careful to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. Wouldn't it be a sad thing if God had victory for us, but we didn't choose it? Wouldn't it be a waste of the goodness of God if He showed us the way, but we were not, we're not willing to walk in that way? And who would be the, the worse off? God is God. He is perfect. He is forever. And you and I are not. And he's drawing us to himself. And he wants to bless. Did you hear me? He wants to bless you. He knows where you are. He knows your needs. He wants to bless you in a mighty way so that you can observe his ways, his nature, and his goodness so that he can bless you. He wants so very much to give you the victory that you dream about. If you have your Bible, stand up with me in honor of reading God's Word, and as we look in Deuteronomy chapter 6, in verse number 1. 
Now this is the commandment. These are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded you to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are to crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all His statutes and His commandments which I command you, you and your sons and your grandsons, all the days of your life, that all your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, and I pray that we do, the Shema, Hear, O Israel, be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you. Promised you. Did you hear that? A land flowing with milk and honey. When I hear those words, that means something beautiful and sumptuous. Something that is there that we can partake of and devour and be blessed by. That is our God's desire for us. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These words I command you today shall be in your heart. Now listen, church. You shall teach them diligently to your children shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. The last thing on your mind at night, the first thing on your mind in the morning, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. You shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You're going to always have these reminders of God and His love. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a large and a beautiful cities which you did not build. This is grace, folks. Houses full of all goods which you did not fill. Hewn out wells which you did not dig. Vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. When you have eaten and are full. That's what God wants, folks. He wants you to have of His abundance. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it abundantly. He says, when I've done all these things, then beware lest you forget who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve Him, shall take oaths in His name, You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you. Let's pray. Now, Father, we have read your word that you gave us to remind us that you are the God who is the great God that sits upon the throne. You watch us even now. You know our hearts even now. We pray, Lord, that you would whisper to our spirits even now. Lord, let us be reminded that you have a path for us, a plan predestined before the foundation of the world. The wooing of the Holy Spirit has called us to it. And for, Lord, if we would be so wise, Lord, if we would open our ears and empty our hearts of everything else so that we could understand and, Lord, grasp and choose the victory that you so mightily want to give us, then, Lord, we can be your people. And others will see and know as Rahab saw and knew that you were God and be drawn to you, O Holy One. And, Lord, that we would not take you lightly or for granted or give you reason to be jealous. Father, bless these next few moments and bless us in the moments and the days that are ahead as we seek to walk out your will. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. There are two pictures the Lord wants us to see. One is the Red Sea and one is the Jordan River. The Red Sea was there when God desired to take them out of bondage, out of the place of enslavement, out of the oppression 
that the world had placed upon them. He had sent the Deliverer to them. The Deliverer under the hand of God had showed them the mighty acts of the hands of God. One of those was the Passover. One of those, the last of the plagues, would be seen by the people of Egypt, but would be practiced by the people of Israel. They would take the lamb, and in the ways that God had told them, they would prepare the lamb. And they would take the blood of the lamb, and they would put it on the lintels of the door, so that when the death angel comes, listen to me now, when the death angel comes, and he is coming for all of us, he would not judge them in their sin, but would pass over them in redemption and give them life. We look back as the children of Israel did to the Passover for what God did for them. But for us, we look back to the cross and we see the blood that Jesus shed for us. We see the redemption of what He did for us. We see the new life as He came to give His life, but bring it back so that you and I could have abundant life. They look back at the Passover we look back at the cross, but when we come to those places, we can't stay there. We've got to cross over. So what he did to teach the children of Israel, when he took them out of Egypt, he didn't lead them to the north. He took them to the east, and he brought them to the place he wanted them to be. They needed to be there. And as they were there at the Red Sea with mountains on this side and mountains on this side and an angry Egyptian army coming after them to kill them on the backside, there was no way to go, listen to me now, but forward. And they could not go unless God would make a way. God would have to part what was immovable to them. And that's exactly what they did. God not only gave them the redemption, God gave them the path to walk it out. And the Red Sea is the picture of salvation for the children of Israel. If they stayed on one side of the Red Sea, what would happen? They would have been absolutely massacred by the Egyptian army. They would have died in that place of unbelief. But by seeing, believing, trusting, accepting, and walking it out, they walked through in victory. And when they got to the other side, they found themselves in the wilderness. And God's plan was to be with them in the wilderness. But God's plan was to take them to the promised land. And to do that, they had to come to the edge of the promised land. And once again, they had to see the will of God. Listen to me now. The promises of God. They had to believe. They had to trust. They had to accept. And once again, they had to walk it out as God would once again cross the waters and they could pass over the Jordan River into the land flowing with milk and honey that God had prepared for them. The Red Sea was a picture of salvation. The Jordan River was a picture of victory. But the problem was, once they crossed over from the promise, uh, from this land of slavery into the wilderness, they decided to stay there. There are two great things that we need to have in our life, and one of them is evangelism, salvation. We need to. That'd been a good time to say Amen, folks. Y'all, y'all believe that? You believe that people need to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord? Do you believe that the blood of Jesus Christ would find anyone, anywhere, there's no sin that anyone ever committed, that God would not love and forgive and, and just make them blameless before Him? 
That's the need of the world. The most powerful thing in all the world is the power of the salvation of Jesus Christ. Amen? But then God did not want us just to stop there. That's not, that's the starting point, not the end point. And so many people look at salvation as uh, 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 something that they've accomplished, that they've gotten to, and as long as they've got there, they're going to heaven one day. Amen, hallelujah, praise God. And God says, no, I've got so much more for you. I've got so much more that I want to give you that you can accept and have. Not only evangelism, there's something we call discipleship. And yes, that's a function of the church, but the church is the people. And discipleship is us walking out the precepts and the principles, the promises and the truths of God. Learning them and learning to obey them. But if we don't see them, Accept them, believe them, trust them. Not only access them, but walk it out. We're not going to live in victory. Here is the, the point in the lives of so many Christians. Praise God, they, got, they crossed over the Red Sea and they found salvation. Amen? But yet, they got to the Jordan River and said, no, I like it better on this side. We need wilderness experiences. Matter of fact, everybody goes through wilderness experiences. Y'all ever have wilderness experiences? I look at the great people that God used in the Bible, and they all had dark times. I, I, for years, sometimes I like to, I, I study so much, right? And I read, and I, I, I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to grow in my walk with God. But one of the things that I do that kind of helps balance me out is I like to read biographies. I like to read biographies of great Christian people. But you know, I've never read a great biography where somebody wasn't broken. I've never read a biography that I, that's worth two cents of somebody that everything that they did was just perfect and glorious and wonderful and they just never had an issue in their life. Have y'all ever found one of those? Usually a great biography is where you find someone who found the end of themselves and then they found the truth to live by, and they walked it out, and God blessed it. Don't we need a, a testimony like that? But yet, everybody has wilderness experiences, and we must travel through the wilderness. There is a purpose for those times. We don't grow when everything's great. Did y'all hear me? We want everything to be great. But we grow when everything's broken. We don't learn when we already think we know everything. Too many Christians <clears throat> have read enough, heard enough sermons, where God is not doing anything to help challenge them towards that victorious life, and that's the reason why they're still in the wilderness. They don't learn because they think that they already know. I hope God challenges me to the day I go to see him face to face. I hope there's some area in my life that God is still working on. When God brought the children of Israel across the Red Sea and they were there in the wilderness, that's where he gave them the Ten Commandments. That's when he taught them to trust him. That's when he, that's when he said that you're going to have to walk this out by faith. Listen, that's when he took them to the edge of the promised land and they sent the spies out and they said it's great and it's wonderful and it's good. But we'll never take it. That's also when they, an entire generation died in the wilderness because they weren't willing to walk it out in victory. God wants so much more for us. We're going to have wilderness times. We must travel through those wilderness times. We must learn God's truth, not learn wilderness truth to live by. We don't need wilderness truth. We live in the world, and Jesus said in His prayer in John 17, I pray not that you take them out of the world, but be with them in the world. 
So as they face these things, they can have an opportunity to grow close to an almighty God. Look in Deuteronomy 6 in verse number 20. When your sons ask you in time to come, saying, what is the meaning of the testimonies, the statutes, the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded you? Remember, back in the first part of that chapter, it said uh, um, in verse number 6 of chapter 6, it said, these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Bind them on your hands, on the frontlets. You shall write them on the doorposts and on your gates. These children had, had been taught these things. It was there, there every day. They sat down to eat, and they said, I wonder what we're going to talk about. Daddy's going to talk about Jesus. He's going to talk about Yahshua, God saves He's going to tell us there's some things that we need to do. Maybe dad's going to sit there and he's going to notice some things in our life and he's going to give us some, some, some truths to live by. He's going to say, son, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. But if you trust God, don't listen to the other kids at the playground that are doing the wrong things. Don't follow them. A little kid will come home and say, Dad, Dad, Daddy, they, they taught us this in school. No, 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 no. That's not the Word of God. We follow the precepts and the principles and the, the things of God, the truths that show us the love of God. That's the things that we follow. So when he gets to verse number 20, that when they, when they come to him and they say, what's the meaning of these things? Verse 21, Then you shall say to your son, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us up out of Egypt with a mighty hand. The Lord showed signs and wonders before our eyes, great and severe against Egypt, Pharaoh and all of his house. Listen to this. Listen to verse 23. Then he brought us out from there that he might bring us in. He brought us out so that he might bring us in. He didn't leave us there, but the purpose of bringing us out was so that he could bring us in to give us the land of which he swore to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Then it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God as He has commanded us. But this is what has happened. What you allow into your mind is what you're going to live. And we've ignored the truths and the precepts and the principles of God. Deuteronomy 6, the teachings there. We followed the truths of this world. We teach the truths of this world to our kids. Listen to your pastor real plainly. And our kids don't know it. And they have accepted the falsehoods of this world. And they have believed them as truths. Let me explain. And by the way, I'm going to talk about a few things real quick. All of them are very controversial in the world right now, and I could care less. I'm not going to argue the points. My job is not to argue with anybody. My job is to teach the Word of God. What you say about it, what you think about it, what you do about it, you come talk to me about it. I'll sit down and talk with you hours if I need to. That's, that would be a great privilege for me, but there are some things that the world has bought into that the church has bought into doesn't even know it and realize it. Evolution is taught as fact. Evolution is fiction. Genesis 1, verse 1 says, And God created the heavens and the earth. We didn't evolve. We have Step back a little bit. This is what the church has done. Well, they teach 
They teach evolution. But we believe in creation. And we just leave it at that. When parents need to not only say, we believe in God, we believe in creation, they need to explain it to them and teach it to them morning and night and all the times. They need to give them not just one-word sentences or just little bitty fragments. They need to share it in love, the truths of it. And this is what has happened because of it. Today, there is a buzzword called global warming. Now listen to me. Evolution teaches that this world is just evolving, it's just growing, and that we are tearing this world apart by how we treat it. Now, let me pause here for just a second. We're also told to be good stewards, so everything that we do, we should be good stewards of. Amen? One of the first things that I learned in first grade was not to litter. And I cannot tell you how to this day, that is just born, that is deep in my heart. If, if I see somebody litter, litter, throw just trash away, it just burns me up, right? I believe that we should be good stewards of everything that God places before us, amen? But listen, the Psalms 24.1 says, the, the, the earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein. Evolution teaches that this world is evolving and we have a hand in it. I'm telling you, the Creator, God, has a hand in it. And I can't tear up what God won't let me. Right? And, and, and it says, oh, we're just burning up and burning up and burning up. It will burn up, but not by global warming. It will burn up by the hand of God. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Revelation tells us that at the end, God will end it here, not man. But yet, you see, there's one thing we talk about evolution, but the flow from it. If you polled the young people today, you would be astounded by how many of them have bought into global warming. I, I watch the Weather Channel every now and again. Y'all ever watch the Weather Channel? I don't know what it is that's fascinating about the Weather Channel, but I get up and I watch the Weather Channel. And they always say, in this day in history, this was this, the, the hottest day we ever had. Have you ever seen how many of those were in the 1800s? Hottest day we've ever had has been in the 1800s, but we're just killing it right now. I, I think God's got it. Do I think we should pollute? No. No, obviously not. But there are things that come from, let me, let me, let me quickly. The family. Is the family under attack? Matter of fact, we, we're having trouble even defining what a family is. Is it a man and a woman, a man and a man, a woman and a woman? What is a family? Is it an it and an it? And I'm not being rude. That's their words. Right? But what happens when the family get, comes under attack? We, listen, I pray that you hear me in the next few moments. We must love every one of God's created beings the same. Every human being deserves the same love that Jesus Christ had for them when He gave His life so that they could have eternal life with Him. I don't care where they come on the atmosphere. I don't care how they define themselves. We must love them. But let me tell you, as we have allowed this attack on the family and we have been so, so lenient, let me tell you what's happening now. God created man to be with woman and create a family. I'm not worried about the women and the women. They can't have kids. I'm not worried about the men and the men. They can't have kids. Uh, it, there, there's got to be a man and a woman. Can I get an amen? All right, but listen. This is what we, this is the feeding down from it. In the attack on the family, promiscuity has come in. And nobody thinks anything about that now. Hold on. It was supposed to be one man, one woman. Let them come together. They don't have all the garbage and they don't have all that ugly thinking from being with all these people beforehand. 
because they're chasing after their, their creature comforts and desires. People that get married today, they come to me and they say, oh, that, I've, I've been with 10 people before. I've been with 15 people before. And then they're bringing all of that into it. And it's killing the family. And birth control has become the, the topic of the day. And how in the world we got to defining that life, that the world calls it a fetus. They don't call it life. And it's okay to, to take that life because we don't call that a child. We call that a fetus. How in the world do we ever get so far? Because we let some things be taught to our kids. And our kids, the statistics of how many kids graduate high school that still have their virginity will scare you to death. Not only are they losing their virginity, many of them in middle school. They're doing multiple partners. But yet, where's the teachings of the family? Where are the parents and the grandparents and the churches saying, because God loves you, He didn't want to see you in pain. He doesn't want you to go through all these things, and yet we've allowed it to come in. Wilderness thinking. Worldly thinking. I could go on and I could go on and I could go on, but listen to me. <laughs> we need to cross over into the promised land. I woke up one day this week and uh, I, I grabbed my Bible and went to the living room and me and the Lord talked for a little bit and I read the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes was written by a man by the name of Solomon. Had great wisdom. Accomplished a whole lot of stuff. Matter of fact, everything that he laid his hand to, he did in a big way. It made a mess out of everything. I don't know that there's anybody in Scripture that God's hand of blessing was on more that messed it up more than Solomon. And because he didn't teach his children the ways of God, Rehoboam was a weak king, and the, 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 the land was split apart. Solomon used this word, vanity. Like a breath that is breath breathed out and gone. Like a vapor. Nothingness. And there are people that are building their lives and their families and their principles on the, on the principles of vanity. Solomon tried it. It didn't work. Money, accomplishments, fame, buildings, things, clothes, women. Good gosh, did he try out women. 700 wives, 300 concubines. Come on now. And yet, vanity. Vanity. There is a foundation that we have for Christian people, salvation. And Jesus says we build our life with what we do with our salvation. And there are a lot of people today that are building on that salvation, that salvation foundation a lot of the things of the world while others are trying to live their life on the foundation of Jesus Christ. The jewels, the preciousness of the gold and the silver of the truths of God. While others are building it on what the world calls beauty and wealth and wisdom and education and free love and all that. But God calls it wood, hay, and stubble. <clears throat> Have y'all ever seen a house that was burnt out? I mean, it has a foundation that's there, but it's just burnt out. Doesn't it look bad? There's a lot of well-meaning Christian people who have compromised with the world and they followed the wisdom of this world rather than being a fundamental person of God. 
standing on the truths of God, living them, making them their, 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 their being. And they're living out hollowed shells of life that once may have been beautiful to the world, but are ugly to God. But those of us who are wise will choose the things of God and walk in them. If we do, there will be victory. If we don't, there will be consequences. Over the next three weeks, we're going to talk about how to walk that victorious life. But today, you really got to decide, do you even want to try? 